Welcome into the Atlanta Sports Party, your home for the best sports talk here in Atlanta. It's local insight you can't get anywhere else but right here at Locked On. I am your host, Tanitra Batiste, and alongside me are Jarvis Davis and Maria Martin. This episode of our Locked On Atlanta Sports Party is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more right now. New customers, you can join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets. Now, that's if your bet of $5 wins. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. And of course, today's episode of our Atlanta Sports Party is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Now, guys, think nephew is growing up right before our very eyes and it is so cool to see of course we're going to talk about that a little bit later in our deep dive and should he come back or should he not we'll talk about the status on 11 and around the metro but first guys we got to talk about whether or not Ra was dropping some hints some nuggets down in Orlando, of course, we know this week it's been the NFL owners meeting and we've heard so much buzz about rules changes. But let's face it, here in Atlanta, our focus was on when it was time for the NFC coaches to speak, particularly Coach Raheem Morris, because everybody was looking for nuggets, whether that was conversation and feedback on the quote unquote controversy around Kirk Cousins and any tampering that may have involved the departure of Desmond Ritter, which we'll get into as well, or what this show loves to talk about, which is any hint, any clue, any observations about the draft. So that said, Jarvis, uh, Coach Raheem Morris dropped some interesting comments. He did acknowledge, indeed, that, hey, we need a pass rusher. He talked about going out and getting one um, from any veterans that may still be available or even come available, as we know. Some veterans may surprise us by the June 1st uh, deadline, right? But what he really said that I thought was intriguing was about the draft. He said, hey, this is a deep draft class. And yes, you want veterans, but there are also some young guys like uh, Byron Young and Kobe Turner were for him with the Rams that could really hit the ground running. You think by chance that gave us any clue at what Raheem Morris and this Falcons organization is going to do at eight? I'll do it the same exact thing. When I saw that, that video clip on Twitter or X, whatever you want to refer, refer to it as, I tweeted out that Marvin Sapp uh, uh, gif. Put the hands up in the air like, yes, Lord. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go ahead and get these pass rushes because when he said, T, like, I just got so happy when he just said, you know, you can never have too much pass rush. Like, oh, it just it just touched my soul. I was just happy. And I even came across a video of, of, of uh, Byron Young, the prospect, the defense tackle out of uh, Texas, doing the, going through the whole uh, double team and splitting the double teams. And it was like three or four times instances where he had split him. I was just like, this is music to my ears. This is a symphonic type situation feeling I'm getting in my soul right now. I was just, I was just so happy yesterday. But, yeah, I think they did tip their hand just a little bit. But I, we, the guys that you named, you know, um, by Byron Young and, and uh, Turner, those guys were like mid-round guys. So yeah. doesn't necessarily say they're going to go first round, although I would love to do it. But it just goes to show that they have an eye for it and they yeah. are looking for it and they know that they need it. And I think that that's all I ask for right now, T. And Maria, Raheem did give a caveat, just like Jarvis said, where he said it's a deep class of edge rushers and they're looking for someone who fits at some point in the draft with what this organization is looking for so you know Raheem he is awesome with knowing how to nuance things to make sure we're not thinking oh he's already told us where they're going at eight he's like no no this is a deep edge rush clash class that we can potentially consider in addition to veterans because hey just like he was able to put Turner and Young next to an Aaron Donald you've got a David on Yamada you've got a Grady Jarrett and some others who you can put some young guys around who can make an impact yeah and I think what's really great about what Terry Fano and Raheem Morris both said and yeah. revealed is that they do want to add youth they didn't shy away yeah. from saying that so at least they did tip their hand and that they're going to be using the draft to fill potentially the edge rusher position that we're all clamoring for and also corner, which is a big need for the Falcons as well. And, and Raheem said that it is possible that they do add youth in those positions. So it does make me feel like the draft is where they're going to go out and get some of those guys. Obviously, the Falcons still need another quarterback, which I thought was one of the bigger things to come out of these meetings as well. They want someone to compete with Taylor Heineke. Um, behind Kirk Cousins, obviously. But yeah, I think that it's smart to get youth 
you know, he talked about the veteran presence and that that's always a good thing. Talked about, you know, pitching his ideas to Calais Campbell to return for another season. Calais, we don't know if he's going to retire or return as a Falcon. Um, but he did say that youth is important as well. As much as it behooves everyone to have a veteran there, especially the edge rusher position or the corner position, youth is great because they can grow in that defense and what Raheem's trying to build. I think that's a great call, Maria, as well, because you just called out one, Calais Campbell at 36. Grady's not getting any younger either. So yeah. you do want to start start to kind of reload on the defensive side so that as those players evolve, uh, just their sunset, if you will, of their careers, you, you have the ability to reload without having to go back in the draft. You've already kind of built players into your system, kind of grown them up and developed them in your system. And I think the other thing is this, although we don't like to say it out loud, and so I'm not going to say it, too loud for anyone to hear any of the football angels, but Calais Campbell is getting older. And honestly, we don't know what Grady's going to be when he comes back from the injury. So Raheem Morris and Terry Fontenot have to think ahead about those things, no different than they had to think ahead about Maria, like you said, the QB position, knowing that, yes, you've got a Kirk Cousins, potentially you have a Taylor Heineke. So you've got to make a call on what you're going to do with the Desmond Ritter. And the decision was, Hey, we're going to move on. And Raheem, you know, reiterated, it wasn't necessarily a request of Desmond Ritter like Kenny Pickett. I think Desmond Ritter would have probably preferred to stay here and maybe learn and grow under Kirk Cousins or even continue to grow under uh, a Taylor Heineke. But when you look back at the comments where he literally said, hey, I wasn't taking a shot necessarily at Ritter by saying what we needed. Did you think the shots were kind of fired? No, I really don't. Um, and especially because he clarified the fact that Desmond didn't go to him and, and request a trade. And, and the yeah. day that Kirk was coming into the building, when I was there for his introductory press conference, I was talking to a couple people around the Falcons facility, and they all told me that Desmond had been there at <laughs> Flower Ranch. He had been working. He'd been in the building. He'd been wanting to get in there early. So yeah. I don't think there was any kind of desire for Desmond to leave. It's just the way that things shook out. They saw him as a easily movable piece. And yes. I understand why. I understand both sides of it. Would it have been nice for him to learn from Kirk Cousins? Of course it would have. He would tell you the same thing. But at the same time, it makes a lot of sense to move on from him. And I don't think there's any bad blood. I think, you yeah. know, you guys know, and I've said it many times on the podcast, what happened to Desmond was unfortunate. I think he was put in an impossible situation. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe, you know, a fresh start for him would be nice. And yeah. getting a short quarterback is still important for the Falcons because Taylor oh. Heineke may not be your end-all, be-all backup quarterback. And they right. know that. And they want someone to bring the pressure and compete. I don't know that they're going to carry three quarterbacks, but who knows? Maybe they bring somebody in and they beat out Taylor. You never know. And I think when you talk about that extra roster spot that that the NFL afforded the team, so it kind of yeah. makes sense, right? You know, for them to be able to, because Logan Woodside was able to take advantage of that last year. Mm -hmm. for Smith, but I think overall, I don't, I don't think it's it was a shot at Desmond Ritter. I think it was more of a indictment on Arthur Smith, right? Because like like Maria mentioned, like he's the one that put that tag and said, "Hey, this is our QB one." You yeah. know, after four starts, you know, in the previous in his rookie season. And and I think that if you're gonna get into get to a point where you're gonna spend all you spend all that money last year on, on the defense side of the football, that means you're trying to win now. To give a guy who only had four NFL starts, and I feel like coming coming out of Cincinnati, like the ceiling wasn't that high anyway. I think you just put him in a very bad situation, and I think that I don't necessarily blame Desmond Ritter. Harley at all. That's why I feel like it wasn't a, a real shot, but I think it was more so of an indictment on Arthur Smith and mm -hmm. putting him in that situation because we all know the quarterback situation has been oogly ever since uh, Matt Ryan was traded to the uh, Indianapolis Colts. Yeah, yeah it, literally. It, and it's one of those things where I heard something on air and they said, oh, the QBs, the quarterbacks situation, like with an S and I said, quarterbacks. Oh, yeah, that's right. Mariota. Oh, yeah, that's right. Literally. <laughs> and literally. You right here, didn't you? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Literally, you try to put it out of your mind. You try to have selective amnesia because the, the play was so poor. So, yeah, yeah, it's one of those things. I agree with you guys. Raheem, his style isn't really to throw shade, but it is real matter of fact. And he's just going to tell you what it is and kind of move on. And speaking of telling it like it is, RJA showed some MVP caliber comments and just maturation in the way he just told us like it was. We'll talk about it on the other side in the deep dive. 
This episode of our Atlanta Sports Party is brought to you by FanDuel. Okay, everybody on this podcast, Maria, Jarvis, and yours truly, we can all admit, brackets busted. Probably were busted day one. <laughs> Unless, of course, you had all the ones and all the twos moving on to the Sweet 16. But it doesn't matter because FanDuel still got you covered. You can still bet on every game of the tournament. Of course, games back in action for men's basketball tonight. Now, whether you're betting on a big upset, it could still happen. Or whether you're betting on a top seed, which all four are still in the dance, this is the place for you to go. It's America's number one sports book. Now, right now, new customers can get two hundred dollars woohoo in bonus bets if your five dollar bets wins that's 200 bucks you can use it on point spreads or money lines and again you can even still pick who's gonna win it all so just visit fanduel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets i can't believe that we're two and a half weeks not, not even two and a half weeks a week and a half away from them cutting down the nets. Is it going to be a repeat performance from UConn? Is U of H going to get to cut the nets this time? Or will it be dun, 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 Carolina? Can you tell I'm a little bit of a fan? Anywho. <laughs> Anyway, don't forget to go to fanduel.com slash locked on and you can make bets until they cut down the nets. All right, guys, we got the privilege. We It was like we got bad news, good news, Maria, on Wednesday, because, of course, we got the bad news that, unfortunately, we have to wait one more day for the Atlanta Braves to begin their 2024 march to a World Series, as we've heard, World Series or bust this entirety of the spring season, spring training season. But we got good news, too. We got an article, Ronald Acuna Jr. dropped an amazing article, I feel like, anyway, in the Players' Tribune where he really kind of walked us through his journey from being a child in Venezuela all the way up to where he is today and how all of those experiences formed the now National League MVP, Ronald Acuna Jr. I just have to ask you, I know all three of us had an opportunity to read it and kind of take it in 24 hours later. What was your biggest takeaway from Ronald Acuna Jr.'s article. Accountability. That was my biggest takeaway from the whole thing is that he was accountable for a lot of the things that, you know, had transpired over the outside view looking in um, since he's been with the Braves. And he kind of clarified a couple things, admitted that he was wrong in some of those instances. And I think what people forget about Ronald is that when he came to the Braves, he was literally a child himself and he's matured over the course of that. And I think it's hard when you're growing up in front of a bunch of people, you know, if you were to take a microscope of all of our lives as we're growing up, you yeah. wouldn't like everything that you see. It's it's part of being a human being. And so I, I thought that it was important that he admitted some of those things. Um, he showed you that his hunger, his desire, his confidence, all of that is still there. But I just liked that people were able to see the maturation that I think all of us have seen, um, you know, when you're closer to him on a day-to-day yeah. basis. And it, it's nice. I, I like the way that he phrased everything. I thought it was a really nice and well done article in the Players' Tribune. I'm proud of him for doing that. And I think it took Thanks. a lot of courage. Um, he's the best player in baseball. And to take himself out of the spotlight for a second, but also put himself back in, in the way that he was very vulnerable. He was honest. I thought it was really, really great. I was so excited to read the whole thing. And I think the coolest thing of the entire article, I think I, I tweeted out the snippet from 2019 when he got in the argument and he learned from that and all that's great. But to me, it was his vision for this year is they're at Truist Park and they're competing to be in a World Series championship. And he said, I need to be there. I need to yes. be a part of it this time. And I yes. thought that that was very important. Oh, yeah, Maria. I really like that as well, because I've always said that's what I re- reiterated almost daily on our old ATL Day One show, that I thought Ronald Acuna Jr. was on mission because he felt like he just wasn't a part of that run to the World Series. When you're not physically out there at for that yeah, last right. out, if you will, or that last at bat, Not that you didn't contribute, but you do feel some kind of way, like maybe you weren't there. And I feel like that was confirmation. Like, yep, that's kind of what we all thought that you you've been on mission since that moment. Just no different than maybe what we're seeing with Spencer Strider and how he felt because of what happened with the Phillies last year. But yeah, I love the vulnerability and I love him kind of taking us back to that little boy, Ronald Acuna Jr. And yeah, that kid who would do what I think a lot of us kind of did in some way, shape or form, right? Whether you were kicking the rocks 
or rock skipping across the water or whether you were taking the newspaper and balling it up and making it a baseball. I think he all just got us to appreciate the human side. I think here we already love him. So we just it just made us love him more. But if you didn't really like him or know him or all you knew was the bravado Jarvis that maybe you saw at the end of a blast to left center or right field, this now tells you this guy is not just a special human on the field. He's a special human overall. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. And I, and I love how he framed the whole cell. I love that fact that you brought up the whole celebration piece because he talked about not only under understanding, right? You know, coming in and celebrating like that, but also saying like, hey, man, this is who I am. Like, yeah. I get so much joy when 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 I get a hit or or or, or just you just tell like he just enjoys playing the game and 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 I think one of the things that I've always kind of been a little wary about when it comes to baseball the old the old the traditional guys quote unquote is the <laughs> fact that like you're supposed to celebrate a certain way or act like you've been there. Sure. No. Yeah. But yeah. No. Like, let me celebrate. I'm yeah. a human being. I have emotions. So it's okay to show emotions. And I, and I think that, you know, for him to be, to go through that maturation process to say, yeah, as I look back, yeah, I, I probably shouldn't have done that, you know, especially for Dave since on day two, since I got into the league, right. You know, and hit a home run. It, but yeah. at, at the end of the day, like I enjoy playing this game and this yeah. is how I'm going to play it. And I have that right to do so. You brought up a really good point. And I was thinking it the whole time is that I really hope the traditionalists read this article. Yes. Um, I think it's very important because baseball is changing whether people yes. want it to or not. Yeah. And it's a good thing for the game. You know, I'm a traditionalist, honestly, when it comes to football and uniforms, like I love old school. However, I also think it's important to adapt with the times. And baseball is a game that has needed to evolve for a long time. It's starting to gear towards a younger audience and yeah. Acuna is that younger audience. And so you want to understand why he feels this way, why he acts this way. I've always loved his celebrations. I've always thought yeah. it was uniquely and authentically him. Um, and taking that away from someone just because it's not traditional in baseball, I don't think is very fair. And so yeah. I think to listen to him say, this is my identity. This is how I live, breathe, eat, sleep. It is baseball. Um, and the fact that he's become a dad. I mean, I even yeah. asked him that in spring training. You know, why Why is it different for you now? And he's like, oh, I get, I get to bring my family around. And it, it's really nice to have them come along. And I'm sure he would have loved that experience when he was a little kid, too. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I just, I loved it. And I think everyone should read it. Yeah. And I think, too, another area where I thought he showed some maturity. Like some people may have thought he was low key throwing some shade at Freddie Freeman because he talked about leaders and how different leaders manage and how he's learned and grown from those situations. But I, I felt like he's learned and grown from those situations. Yeah. We don't necessarily know how Freddie feels. Maybe that'll be a conversation for another day. But I think for him to also acknowledge that part as well, that's a part of all of our growth. Like how many of us have not kind of bucked the system or tried to buck the system with authority and then look back and said, oh, I'm okay with bucking the system. Maybe I just should have bucked it a little bit different or maybe I just shouldn't have gone as hard in the paint. So yeah. I think it was really good for him to talk about that as well because that shows a level of maturation. I also think, and again, this is Tanitra saying this, this is not Ronald Acuna Jr. saying this, but personally, I like the timing because He's yeah. showing so many things to let you know, no offense, Shohei Otani, but they're just pieces to the puzzle that Ronald Acuna Jr. has just shown us, right? Like he, he's always been open to talking to the media just through his translator, right? But I can understand if you're not talking yourself, maybe you don't have a lot of words to say. Maybe it's a, there's a little bit of apprehension, but the more we get to talk to him as well, like him, we get to see the personality, we get to see the passion, we get to see the frustration when there's frustration, we get to see it all. So I love that. I love that this dropped right before opening day because he is putting his stamp low key on this league and saying, yep, there are a lot of guys out there. There's a, a Shohei Otani and there's an um, Aaron Judge and there are so many other guys, but I am that guy and I'm saying it's a different face, but I'm the face of, of Major League Baseball. I yeah. love it. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's it's so, like, just for him to be so vulnerable, like, there is, I feel like that is, that's so mature, right? But when you yeah. think about, 
like, hey, I'm a man now. A man. Like, I yeah. came in as a boy, <laughs> and I'm a man now. And, and be, have, be so self-reflective in, in the article. I, I just And talk about, because, you know, some people may feel some type of way that, hey, he was upset because he wasn't out there in 2021. Or some people maybe even look at it as being selfish. But for him to reveal that and kind of give, he like, hey, man, I prayed. I prayed to be famous, you know, like I, 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 this was, this was my, this is, I feel like my destiny. I'm me. I'm actually achieving that. Like not many people get a chance to do that for him to say, you know, this is what I want to do from my early age and be able to get that to that spot. And then it'd be taken away in the biggest moment in the organization for him as a professional and sit there, have to watch it on TV. Oh my God. Like that is, that's not something that, you know, that should be taken lightly. And for him to be able to reveal that and be open and honest about that, I feel like, like I, I'm excited. I'm excited about this, about the season. I'm, I'm ready to roll. Like, yeah. can we skip through this 162? Maybe <laughs> exactly. 81? Yeah, and then kind of go on from there and kind of see how it rolls. That's right. Yeah, let's just get to it. Yeah, I, I think it, it's absolutely amazing too, because think about, I, I, I just took my first international trip last year. And at 18, he didn't take an international trip. Trip. He moved to an entirely new he country. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. So again, yeah. yeah. So again, you get to put all that context around his experience and it just makes you love him all the more. But like you guys said, make you absolutely, it also makes you excited about what we're going to see this season because I th we thought he went off last year, but I feel like, oh, everybody better just hang tight because this guy is about to go off. It's yeah. going to be an interesting and a fun ride for him. It's ramping up, of course, for the Braves, ramping down in some way, shape, or form for the Hawks. So you got to ask yourself the question, should they or should they not, as this regular season ramps down, bring back their guy? We'll talk about it in Around the Metro. So think about this. There's a concert out there that you want to check out. Or there is a game that you want to check out. Obviously, the Braves will be back home really soon. But maybe you don't know until the last minute that you can actually make it. That is where game time comes in. They have flash deals. They have last minute deals that you can take advantage of. And they'll even allow you to see exactly where your seats are. So that if you want to take advantage of those seats, you can. Or if you decide you don't want those, move it right along. They call it zone deals, right? You pick the section. Game time picks the seats, and that also gives you the opportunity for some big time savings. So you can take some of the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Right now, game time users get $100 off a big game ticket with code Vegas100. Now, terms do apply, but if you download the game time app, which I have, I use it so I can speak on it, use code Vegas, V E G A S for $100 off a big game ticket. Or if you're not going to the game, use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. It is user-friendly. So download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. So guys, we're all waiting with bated breath. The question was asked, obviously, after Monday's Hawks Celtics game for an injury update for Trey, but we figured we'd get it Tuesday. We got it. And basically, he's progressing along. Of course, he had that tear in his left pinky finger, that ligament tear. He got the surgery on February 27th for the tear that happened on the 23rd, and now we're a month out. So according to the Hawks, according to Quinn Snyder, Jarvis, there's been progress, and he'll start kind of doing finger motions, if you will. Exactly. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> I feel like a little kid. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? like, what does that mean? Right. And then I guess once you move from finger motion, then you move to pick up a ball with finger motions. Okay. So that said, these guys have 10 games left in this regular season. And for all intents and purposes, there's an outside chance that they can move out of the 10th. And it's outside after Chicago smoked the Pacers, after the Bulls smoked the Pacers Wednesday night. So Jarvis, with 10 games left, even if Trey Young. You know what, T? I mean, when you think about with 10 games left, like you mentioned, and pretty much uh, you're locked into that 10th spot. I'm okay with seeing what DeJounte Murray leading this team looks like because this dude has been playing lights out. He dropped 30 against the Portland Trailblazers. And, of course, we know he was a catalyst for, for them, uh, that 30-point comeback as well. And I'm just – I love what I'm seeing from a developmental standpoint for Vic Critchie, 
Cretchy, Cretchy, Cretchy. Yeah, I know. Everybody's like, Cretchy, Cretchy, Cretchy. Ball like that. I got to start pronouncing your name. (laughs) VK. Yes, I love that. VK. VK. Um, VK is uh, is been balling and the development with with, uh, DeAndre Hunter coming off the bench. I just love what I'm saying. I love the coaching job that Quinn Snyder is, is putting together with Trey Young out because I feel like we are we know what we're gonna get with Trey. And I, I feel like seeing some of these pieces, some of these uh, um bench pieces starting to come around. Even Bruno Fernando is starting to play some some good yeah, basketball. Yeah. And you know, Lord knows how I feel about him probably about 20 games ago. <laughs> so so I think right now I, I like what I'm seeing. I like seeing this team being scrappy and fighting. And there's no reason for them to push Trey Young back into the fold if he's even if he's clear. Yeah, and Maria, I think to add to that, you've got a draft coming up and you have free agency coming up and you have to make some serious decisions on which of these guys from DeJounte all the way through to the bench unit. You've got to decide, is anybody from that bench mob worth us retaining or any of those guys? And I want to call them kind of the middle guys, meaning like an Anyeka Okongu is a great example. Of course, you're going to retain him, but you want to see where his development is because, yes, he comes off the bench a lot, but he also starts a lot. So this gives you opportunities, although he's on load management now, this little 10-game stretch and really this entire stretch that's kind of been there since Trey's been out, it gives the opportunity to see what those other guys can do so that Landry Fields and Quinn Snyder can determine where they need to go in free agency as far as acquiring players, where they need to go in the draft, and also maybe who they can retain. And if you don't have to push Trey to be in a Jalen Johnson situation, where I did not like him coming back from that ankle injury, and four games later or three games later he was out again, then maybe you err on the side of caution. Demetri, you know, that's a really good question. And I liked what you said a couple of weeks ago. You were talking about you didn't want the Hawks to play too good because then it gives everybody an opportunity to be like, hey, maybe we don't need to make any changes, which we all know that there are changes that still need to be made. And if anything, Trey's absence has shown us something we never would have gotten before. You're seeing a lot of the guys you mentioned in Yakta Kongwu, Dre is playing the best he's ever played since yeah. we've seen him in a Hawks uniform. When were we ever going to get that? And that's no knock on Trey. It's just whenever he's present, you kind of know what you're getting in Trey Young and and other guys feed off of that as well. You're seeing even um, you're seeing DeJounte Murray. I almost said DeAndre Hunter again. You're seeing DeJounte Murray in a different light than when you see him with Trey, which is not a good thing either. You know, you want to see that camaraderie when the two of them are together. But, you know, I think it's interesting. I think if he does come back, you're going to have to be very careful because what they're doing oh, yeah. right now is very, um, I don't want to say it's good because again, we don't want them to play too good, but it is good. You're, you, it's a hodgepodge of guys. It's a bunch of these bench players that are reeling off a couple of straight wins, wins that we didn't think they could. They beat the Celtics the first time around. Um, so yeah, you're going to have to be very careful when he comes back because what they're doing right now, they're in a rhythm. They have a lot of camaraderie. Yeah. There's a lot of chemistry working. And you don't want to blow that up. And I'm not saying Trey would, but it might disrupt what they've got going on. So Mm -hmm. it's a very delicate dance. It is. It is. And you know that someone like a guy like Quinn Snyder is the one who will be able to navigate those waters. And a great job. Yeah, he really has been doing a great job in so many uh, different ways. Now, as we wrap up, I got to ask you guys, I know it's not technically opening day for the Braves. We've got to wait one more day for that. But other than, say, uh, I think it was Dodgers Blue Jays that played over in Japan last week. It's opening day around the rest of Major League Baseball. That said, this is the time when teams show you what they're working with as far as the food court or whatever we call it at the baseball park. So that said, Maria, is there a particular offering you've seen out there? I know some of them have been tweeted. Anything that you're like very intrigued about this baseball season? Yeah, the Yankees are doing like this giant milkshake thing. And I'm a big ice cream girl. Like every time I'm at the Falcons, I need ice cream. Oh, yes. It's the yes. best, you know, the little ice cream self sort thing. Um, I've gotten really good at making it look really pretty too. Um, that tells you I get it way too much. Um, but, but whatever the Yankees are doing, bring that down here because that I just yeah. want a ton of ice cream at a baseball game. I know it's hot, especially here in Georgia, and it kind of gets everywhere. But who cares? It's summertime. That's what I associate with summer ice cream. I love it. It's summer. Oh, uh, let me tell y'all, I, I'm a big seafood guy, right? Outside of my wings. I gotta have my wings first. And then <laughs> number two in my life is seafood, right? So the fielders catch by truest part. Let me tell you what's in this bad boy. Two lobster tails, three fried yeah. oysters, yeah. 
So sweet decadent. potato fries, the bacon, the lettuce. You can take That's that off. Lot. You can throw the tomatoes off there too. But that spicy peach remoulade. Oh, you know I'm a sauce guy, T. You know how I get down. I'm very interested by that. So yeah, I think the fielder's catch might be one I might have to try out once I make my way up to Truist from out of town. <clears throat> I bet. I bet. I can't wait. For me, I'm just not going to take in any of it because, hey, I've got to completely reconfigure my diet. I don't want to say diet, but let's just say my nutritional offerings have to be decidedly different. <laughs> so thanks for sending pictures of things I will never be able to take partake in. <laughs> anyway, we appreciate you, you guys. <laughs> No, nope, I know, right? You asked it. Right? Now you want to be mad. Thanks for stopping by the Atlanta Sports Party. We appreciate you guys. And also don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can find us 24-7 because we are streaming live 24-7. And don't forget to download us wherever you download your podcast. We appreciate you stopping by. And we will see you Monday for the Atlanta Football Party. Falcons edition. Goodbye.